this is Mitchie and welcome back to the Manic Manor podcast. So we're going to talk today about um, the Station Nightclub fire. Now, 20 years ago, back in February, is when this incident occurred. Um, A fire broke out during a rock concert at a Rhode Island nightclub, which resulted in the death of 100 people an injury of 230, making it one of the most deadly fires in the history of the United States. The site of this tragedy, of course, as I said, was the Station Nightclub. And this nightclub had originally been built and founded as an old gin mill back in 1946. Now, it had a change of hands along the way, becoming, you know, a variety of nightclubs and restaurants and taverns and pubs before ending up in the hands of the owners, Michael and Jeffrey Derderin, in March of 2000. Now, we're going to talk about everything that happened, you know, the history of the nightclub before it became the nightclub, um, while it was in the process of becoming the Station Nightclub, and of course talk about the after effects. So this will probably be quite a lengthy episode, but I feel like it's very important to talk about this, especially since we just recently had the 20th anniversary of this fire, and it is listed as one of the deadliest fires in U.S. history. But we're going to go into kind of like the statistics of it. Um, The building was an older roadhouse located in the West Warwick, Rhode Island area. And naturally, it was in need of a lot of work before it was to be reopened for any kind of business. Because prior to the events of this fire, as we will discuss, um, there was another fire that had happened in the club back in 1972 before it ever became the Station Nightclub. But, um... It had been a nightclub by the name of Julio's. Now, first responders were alerted from or of this fire by a fire alarm that was in the building, and they had responded to it, only to find that this roadhouse nightclub had been in, uh, completely engulfed in flames by the time that they had arrived. Now, luckily, there was nobody in the building at this time. So nobody was hurt, there was no injuries, and thankfully no casualties for this. But the interior had sustained significant damage, so it was a totaled building, and they were going to have to start from scratch if they were to like sell it and you know, rebuild. Further investigation into that concluded that the start of the fire um, was near the rear center of the building and had worked its way up into the attic. But, as I said, fortunately, no one had been there, so nobody had gotten hurt. Now, nobody could have predicted this, you know, to be like some sort of omen or anything like that for the years ahead. But after the 1972 fire, the building changed ownership and reverted to a restaurant on reopening after a lot of uh, renovations. And after that, it turned into a pub. But by 1991, records indicated that the building was back to being a nightclub. And it remained a nightclub for roughly about 9 or 10 years. And that's when it landed in the hands of Michael and Jeffrey Derderin. And they are the brothers that bought it in uh, March of 2000. And that's when they named it The Station. They intended to keep it as a nightclub with the purpose of, you know, live music being the center point and, the, and you know, main events as an attraction point of it. Now, with any building and business, um, of course, you're going to have to have inspections and just to make sure that things are up to code to ensure that the building is living up to safety standards. But when we talk about this inspection here, we're going to see that there was quite a lot of um, neglect, I should say, when it comes to, I should say, the brothers and the inspector himself. So, the building is open, obviously, and running, and we look at, like, the first inspection that we see on paper, um, November 20th of 2002, uh, Fire Marshal Dennis P. LaRoque 
um, inspects the nightclub, and upon completion of this inspection, he finds nine violations. Now, these violations are considered to be relatively minor. Nothing that would, like, force the nightclub to be completely shut down, like, completely, um, a health hazard or anything like that that would cause a loss of life by the fire marshal standards. But out of the nine violations, they didn't find anything that would be considered, you know, anything about fire, anything, um, that could cause major catastrophe. However, there is an issue here. They didn't mention anything about flammable substances such as a flammable polyurethane foam. Now, when the brothers were renovating and building up the nightclub, they had supposedly ordered a soundproofing foam for the building because, you know, they're doing, um, you know, live music and entertainment, so they have to have some sort of soundproofing to prevent, you know, noise complaints. Well, apparently the foam that they ordered wasn't necessarily the soundproofing foam that you're supposed to order in these uh, situations. Instead, it was um, just this typical packaging foam that was extremely flammable polyurethane, and it was just glued onto the nightclub's wall from, you know, just the wall up into the ceiling. And the fire marshal didn't notice this whatsoever. It was a complete oversight of his inspection. So he leaves, tells them to um, fix these nine violations without even so much as noticing the foam on the wall, which probably he should have noticed. Now, within a few weeks, on December 2nd of 2002, he returns for a follow-up. Uh, to conclude those nine violations that he had mentioned to be corrected were once again completely overlooked the glued polyurethane foam on the wall so he looks sees that everything apparently is checked off so he signs off the AOK -okay that the inspection has been passed and the station nightclub is good to go so that brings us to the day of February 20th, 2003. Early in the afternoon, um, the state fire marshal, Irvin J. Owens, had given a statement that fire codes all but eliminate a chance of uh, a catastrophic nightclub fire in the state of Rhode Island. And this was because a few days prior in the state of Chicago, there was a stampede that had happened at a nightclub that had trampled they had trampled and um killed 21 people now from what i had seen the brothers were interviewed about this and their response was that this was a very remote situation and was not something that was likely to happen which is kind of ironic when we talk about what is going to happen here now, prior to the events that had happened here, um, Rhode Island used to have what was called the uh, Grandfather Clause. And the Grandfather Clause um, pretty much exempted buildings that were constructed prior to fire codes written in 1968 in the state from having to do any kind of significant changes to their buildings um, regarding fire safety. And, I mean... This is just what I've kind of gathered from my understanding of reading um, the law itself. The Station Nightclub, you know, as I mentioned, was built, founded in 1946. This fire code was written in 1968. And this grandfather code essentially um, prevented it from having to, you know, put in any kind of sprinklers or any kind of extinguishers or anything like that. Um, just kind of prevented it from like updating itself because it was like considered grandfathered in. It didn't have to do anything of that sort. Despite this building being able to, you know, house or inhabit at least 300 or more people at a time and 
I mention this because this is an essential issue when it comes to talking about the problems when they do investigations later about um, the root cause of the problem with this fire and how it changes the history in Rhode Island and how people look at the fire codes in this state. Now, going forth as the evening progressed, um, there was a headlining band that was appearing that night, and it was a heavy metal band, more particularly um, classed in like this glass heavy metal category, and the band's name was Great White, founded by Jack Russell and Mark Kendall, originally in 1977, before having a break and regrouping, and the band consisted, um, as well as um, a guitarist named Ty Longley, and a bass guitarist named David uh, Phyllis, and a drummer named Eric Powers, and they were, they had gone through a decline before they were having a reunion tour, and this reunion tour consisted of them going through various nightclubs throughout, it looked like the eastern side of um, the United States at the point. And part of this gimmick that they were doing on this reunion tour was they were doing pyrotechnic displays within clubs. Which, it wouldn't have been so bad if they were doing it on an outside stage, but the problem here was these were clubs that were on an enclosed space. Now... On one occasion, it could be said and found that a club owner named Dominique Santana, who ran the Stone Pony in Asbury Park, New Jersey, didn't authorize the band to use pyrotechnics and was not even aware that they were doing it. Um, however, the band still performed using the pyrotechnics during a Valentine's Day performance just, you know, a few days prior to this February 20th show. And Santana said, had he known this, he never would have allowed the band to perform because of how dangerous it was. And he was completely taken by surprise when he was watching the band perform. And then out of nowhere, you know, sparks and, you know, everything is flying up out of the stage. And a local disc jockey that had been working on that same set that night was completely uh, surprised and said it seemed like no one other than the band and the manager were aware of what was going on for the show and many of the workers at the um, Stone Pony uh, disclosed how careless it actually was even if it was just for one song you know danger is danger and how um, they were kind of shocked at how little regard that they had for the people around them. And um, it was no different for the station nightclub performance. It's like the band, you know, had a similar setup for this and it was just what they were doing. And, you know, according to, you know, the owners, Michael and Jerry later, they're going to say the same thing as we will see. Now... According to sources, about 462 people had shown up to the nightclub on a Thursday evening to enjoy the show and just to party and let loose and have fun. Now, the club's listed capacity has been up for debate. Um, some say it's probably around 404 maximum, but legally there was still kind of this issue on the real capacity on what it should have been, and it kind of varied on how the club was being used so it was either like either 258 or 404 so you've got a big kind of difference here and it was up to like the fire marshal to decide what this was but he never kind of like put his foot down on what the legal um, capacity was so this is another big issue that we see here but either way now the building's overcrowded and that night, also, there was a local news crew that had shown up to the club to report on, you know, nightclub issues and safety surrounding it. Ironically, because of the issues following the stampede that happened at a nightclub in Chicago just a few days prior. So, around the 11 p.m. hour, the band comes out to perform with their song, Desert Moon. And, you know, you've got an entire group of people that are excited, wanting to get loose, wanting to let go, have fun. 
and it's just hype, you know, heavy metal bands, naturally, if anybody has ever listened to it, it's he- it's natural headbanging music. People are going to just let loose. Now, the band's manager at the time, Daniel Bichel, he, um, sometime within the intro of the song, ignites these pyrotechnics. And as we've mentioned before, with the highly flammable polyurethane foam ignites within seconds. It just ignites the foam on the walls. Um, Something that was supposed to just be like little sparklers turned into like flare, like flare guns. Now, within a minute, there was a blaze that was flashing over and anything that was in reach that was combustible now was on fire. And it didn't take the band members long to realize this either because you've got, you know, the smell of things that are combustible and I'm thinking it's the lead singer that said, you know, this ain't good and now they're starting to abandon ship and they're dashing off the stage. Now the crowd is confused. Some people are a little disoriented. There were people that were towards the back that were closer to the entrance of the... um, station that saw that this probably wasn't normal and so some people were able to exit because they saw that this wasn't part of the show but a lot of people mistook it as part of the gimmick and part of the show which was a fatal mistake thinking that it was part of the act but the thing was these people were trusting the band and trusting you know the owners of the nightclub to keep them safe but Soon enough, when people started to realize that there was a plume of black smoke, this was not an act. And that's when panic started to ensue. Now, you know, fire was dancing across the ceiling because that foam was pretty much coating the entire wall and the ceiling as well. Now, some people were able to leave the second the pyrotechnics went off, as I said, immediately seeing that potential danger. But um, when panic starts to hit, um, a lot of people didn't know what to do, and so fight or flight response kind of takes in. A lot of people started to crowd the front door, not realizing that there were other exits. But one of those exits was already blocked by the flames. So with one of those exits being incapacitated, escape was now becoming extremely limited, and a lot of people were becoming fearsome. So with the front door becoming extremely crowded with people trying to shove their way out, um, one door being blocked, there were some people that went and hid in the bathroom, thinking that, um, you know, help was going to be on the way and maybe they could escape, which kind of just trapped them in there. And this led to a lot of problems. Now, the issue with the nightclub and exiting, this was another major flaw. Um, A mass contribution to injuries and the loss of life was, of course, the main entrance. Um, In the main entrance, it was a small foyer that was designed to keep people out without a ticket. However, when a fire of this magnitude was raging, um, people are shoving, pushing, trying to get out, packing and squeezing, it was causing so much problems and whoever didn't get out they were either trapped or they were getting trampled and it jammed everybody up and people inhaling the smoke and fumes and whatever mess the foam was giving off just made everything even worse and by 11:10 at night that entire building started to become engulfed in flame Now, the handicapped ramps that were surrounding the building were the only main sources of escape for people, and anybody who managed to leave the building were pretty much, you know, throwing themselves out the best that they could, whether it be windows, whether it be through whatever door they were managing to get out of, just trying to get away from the flames, the smoke, and whatever, the heat, just trying to free themselves. 
Now, the first 911 call that was made was reported right after the fire started around 11.09 p.m. So we see here that fire engulfed that building really, really fucking quick. Not even a minute. And it took about five minutes for even the first fire engine to actually arrive on the scene. But five minutes was all it took for devastation to happen. It took such a massive toll. Uh, reports listed stated nothing that the fire department or first responders could have done would have saved the building because, for one, they didn't have sprinklers installed, and two, there was such a mixture of hazardous materials, including the foam that was the igniter of all of it, and the glue that was used as well. It was all just like an essential mixture and tipping point that spread the fire throughout the building. Now, many fire trucks followed initially after that first responder fire truck. Um, a local restaurant across the street called the Coset Inn became a makeshift triage for survivors and burn victims that were being hauled out from the nightclub during all this mass chaos and they were transporting these victims and patients to um, the nearby Kent Hospital before they were being transported to other hospitals that were able to properly treat these burn victims as well. And as a result of this fire and of course you know just day-to-day -day operations for hospitals, um, they, the hospital was reaching its capacity and from you know, the 11 o'clock hour until about 1.30 in the morning, um, things were just so heavy. And it wasn't until about 1.30 in the morning that things started to somewhat clear up. Now, in this time frame, the band's manager um, was interviewed by police. And what he told police was he triggered the fireworks from the side stage near a dressing room. And he told the police that he got permission from the owner, Michael Dardarin, to do so. Now, however, as I mentioned earlier, Michael and his brother counter that statement and heavily denied that they ever gave the band or the, you know, the band manager permission to do so. And statements um, start coming in from survivors and owners of the club in the meantime. And even worse, they start pulling people that are already deceased, either from smoke inhalation or even worse because of the fire itself. So it's already becoming catastrophic. Now the owner Jeffrey, um, who co-owns it with his brother, he's interviewed and tells police that he simply turned while he was watching the band perform and saw the fire break out from the stage now, he tried to play hero and extinguish it with a fire extinguisher, but when that wasn't working, then he went to try to help people evacuate. And of course, he reiterated what his brother said, that he didn't give permission for these fireworks and pyrotechnics to be used at all. Now, by sunrise, 7 a.m., um, it's already confirmed that 39 people had died. But before noon, that total rises to 69, and by nightfall, it's at 96. Um, immediate response to this fire on the 24th of February was a mandatory inspection, blitz of assembly places like other nightclubs, churches, restaurants, theaters, um, in the surrounding cities and towns in Rhode Island that mandated, you know, all sorts of updates of these places to prevent any catastrophes like that again. The following day on February 25th, um, the initial inspector we mentioned of the nightclub, he was questioned and he states to authorities, he never saw any flammable foam on the walls during this inspection. And when he was questioned why he didn't see that, his reasoning was being that he was so blinded by anger because he found an illegal inward swinging door after he had initially ordered that door to be removed from an earlier inspection. He was so mad about a damn door. 
that he just could not be bothered to look at the walls and make sure that there wasn't anything that could possibly catch on fire. So now the state comes in and begins an investigation into the fire into the club. While this investigation goes on, four more people pass away as a result of the fire. Linda D. Sufaletto, she was 43 years old, and she passes away at Massachusetts General Hospital as a result of her injuries on February 28, 2003. Kelly L. Vera passes away at age 40 at Boston <laughs> Shrines Hospital because of her injuries on Mar March 1, 2003. On March 6, 2003, Mitchell C. Schubert, age 39, passes away from his injuries at Massachusetts General Hospital. And on May 4, 2003, Pamela Gutaduria, age 33, passes away at Massachusetts General Hospital from her injuries, making her the 100th victim directly linked um, from fire injuries to pass away. Now the former governor, Carcery, um, pardon me if I mispronounced his name, um, he tried to apply for a major disaster declaration because of this fire, but um, President George W. Bush rejected that request. Um, and lawsuits also started to be filed as early as March 4th of 2003 for victims and their families on behalf of this fire as well because of all of the neglect and callousness that had happened. Um, March 23rd, 2003, St. Anne Cemetery in Cranston, Rhode Island decided that they were going to dedicate a plot of land for a memorial of the nightclub fire and around 26 victims of the fire at that time um, were buried on this plot. Now of the victims of the fire, four of them I gathered were workers of the nightclub and even more disgusting that I discovered and uncovered was while they were doing the investigation of the nightclub, it was discovered that the brothers did not have workers' compensation insurance for the employees, which was a requirement for them to have. They ended up getting smacked with a million dollar fine for not having that insurance, and that ended up not getting resolved until 2013, when a judge had to uphold that they, in fact, did have to pay that fine. The fact that it took them a whole 10 years to even pay that fine when they were responsible to hold that type of insurance is just baffling. Now, not even a few months since the fire, um, two members of Great White held a reunion show on April 29, 2003. Because um, one of the members, the guitarist that I mentioned, Ty, uh, mentioned, Ty Longley, he had gone back into the building to get his guitar and equipment for the band and ended up passing away. He succumbed to the fire. He was one of the victims. They held a benefit concert where they would perform for a few minutes to raise money in memory of him. Um, he died, as I said, and um, that money that they were going to raise... Um, was going to go to Longley's girlfriend to help care for her and Ty's unborn child. However, it was only stated that some of that money would go to her. Now, I don't know if she ended up getting all of that money or if she even got any of that. But I do know that they got some backlash because of that and because of another benefit concert that they were going to try to do. Now... The death toll didn't just stop at 100 for these victims. It still grew because there were survivors that, um, you know, they were dealing with PTSD. And they don't 
they didn't initially get added because I think they weren't, you know, directly linked from the fire itself. It was like aftermath, so they didn't get added to the toll. Um, but there was a victim, um, a survivor, Jennifer Stowers, age 23, who was um, um, suffering from extreme PTSD because of the fire. She was um, prescribed antidepressants, and she was supposed to get married in six weeks when, unfortunately, she was found dead from an apparent overdose. Now, the coroner who had examined her couldn't determine if she had intentionally took her life or if it was an accident because her body wasn't able to properly metabolize the medication that they gave her, but it was um, reported because, you know, of her being there the night of the fire and everything, and it's such an, inf an unfortunate thing, you know, she was so young and, you know, had such a bright future, and just to be going to a nightclub just to enjoy some time and to be stuck with this trauma from such carelessness and callousness only to have her life just you know ripped away from her was it's so heartbreaking now one of the owners Jeffrey I wanted to throw this in here because um, he had another job as a news reporter and I probably is going to sound rude of me to say, but I don't, uh, he ended up losing his job from all the backlash that he was receiving and everything because of the incident at the nightclub. Um, he had to quit his news job as an anchor. I don't know if he said how unfair it was or anything like that, but in my opinion, it kind of pales in comparison to what all these victims and their families went through. Um, and things just continued to not look good for these brothers as well. Um, because, as I said, you know, it's probably not going to look good on me to say anything like this, but the reason I say this is because they don't take full accountability for any of the actions. With them being the owners of this nightclub, there is still some accountability that they do have to take because they have a duty to be responsible and ensure the safety of any patrons that come into their club. Now, they had done interviews and stuff where they had kind of shifted the blame from who was actually responsible for this you know the fire itself so the blame was shifted you know from building inspector for not locating the foam despite them being the ones who ordered the foam and installed it to the foam manufacturer once again despite them being the ones who ordered it and they should have been the ones to notice it was the wrong foam and sent it back and got the right one but that's just me. That's just my opinion there. Um, now, one brother said that they did feel guilty in a sense, but they never actually took any blame or responsibility for these actions, for the events that occurred that night. Now, one father of a young victim, uh, Nicholas O'Neill, he had just turned 18, and he was actually the youngest victim. He um, was naturally and rightfully upset over this, said that they were just mitigating and essentially, in a way, whitewashing and completely, you know, belittling their part in all of this. You know, another, another way for them to not take full accountability for their actions. And it doesn't look good for them. Now, unfortunately, another survivor... Um, ends up losing their life may or may not be completely related but um, Lisa Marie Scott age 33 um, she ends up falling down a flight of stairs 
literally six months to the date of the fire and ends up passing away as a result of that. And now we've got um, the Providence Journal coming forth in September of 2003. And this journal, uh, Providence Journal, says at least 412 people had been inside the club when the fire broke out. Which is a piece of damning evidence for the brothers um, showing that the club was over capacity when at max they were only supposed to have 404 people. So that doesn't look good for them either. Now, didn't take long for indictments to come against the brothers and the band manager for manslaughter charges. Um, it wasn't necessarily met with happiness from the victims and families. Um, um, a lot of people believe that the fire marshal should have gotten a charge as well because he should have been able to look at this inspection and should have been able to tell that this building was not safe. But he never got a charge brought against him. And the reason why was because there was something in Rhode Island that state, unless it could be proven that um, the fire marshal had overlooked something like that in bad faith intentionally, he couldn't have a legal you know, indictment brought against him. So... Charges only could be brought against, you know, like the band manager and the owners. And we also see that um, uh, Jack Russell, the lead singer of Great White, he did not face charges either. Probably because he was not the one that actually set off the pyrotechnics, despite um, people saying that, you know, he knew what was going on, but he wasn't, you know, the person to actually set the these things off. So in turn, it was just... The band manager, Bichelle, um, the brothers, Michael and Jeffrey, that got indictments. So, at investigations, um, well, with the investigations at trial, um, they brought everything up. Um, the foam was a big disputing factor. The brothers held firm that they ordered um, sound foam but only received packing foam. It didn't change the fact that they still willingly put up packing foam on the wall. And they tried to bring up that they had the receipts and everything. Still kind of didn't change anything. Uh, the company that sold the foam to the brothers um, did actually pay out a $6.3 million settlement to the families of the victims of the fire. Another problem mentioned was um, doors, an inward door, like the fire marshal mentioned. Um, the brothers claimed that they removed it, but would reinstall it if things were going to be noisy, such as the night of February 20th. And crowding was an issue. The fire marshal had, you know, various capacities for various situations of the club, and whether or not... Um, furniture was being used and moved, so it boiled down to either the capacity of this building was 258 or 404, but still the club was either at 462 or 412 when the fire broke out. And so it was severely over capacity, and it brought down to just, you know, recklessness, carelessness, um, just total lack of you know, taking responsibility. Now, the first criminal trial began for the band manager on May 1st, 2006. But instead of him, you know, taking his chances at trial, he decided to plead built, uh, guilty to involuntary manslaughter of the 100 victims. And he decided to give a statement and give an apology and he um, wanted to give a statement saying for three years he wanted to be able to speak to the people that were affected by the tragedy, but knew that he was that there was nothing that he could do or say to undo what had happened, and that he was essentially, you know, living in this immense guilt, and that he was completely devastated, and that he could only pray that everyone would understand that if he could do anything, that he would do anything to undo what had happened that night. 
and he was profusely apologizing and he didn't want to cause anyone any more pain and he will never forget that night and he'll never be able to um, forget the people that were hurt and he once again had completely apologized. Now, this manager, he was 26 years old at the time of the incident and ended up receiving a 15-year sentence but only had to serve four years as 11 of them were suspended and on top of that he received a three-year probation period. He ended up being released in 2008 and the judge in told said um, the greatest sentence that can be posed on you right now has been imposed on you by yourself. Now that was received with mixed reviews. Some people thought that he got a just sentence with the way that he was acting on himself while the others saying it was extremely light and today he's now off parole and he's living somewhere in Florida. As for the brothers Michael and Jeffrey um, they originally pled not guilty and they were facing trial however they turned that plea into a no contest to avoid trial altogether, probably because, um, you know, with everything that was stacked up against them, it wasn't going to look good. Now, of course, Michael, he received the same sentence as Michelle, a 15-year prison sentence um, to serve, but he got four that he only had to serve in an 11-year suspended sentence with three years of probation. Jeffrey only got 500 hours of community service. The judge on this case, um, he pinned a letter out and saying he only accepted this deal because he wanted to avoid public exposition. He didn't want to, you know, exploit this tragedy and force, you know, the families of the victims and survivors to have to relive trauma that was experienced from both living and dead. Um, his further explanation was the sentencing for each of the brothers reflected their involvement in the fire such as with the purchase of the foam and the installation of it. Now, the Attorney General at the time, Patrick C. Lynch, objected to this bargain, of course, and stated that both of the brothers should have received jail time, even more so, especially that Michael should have gotten way more than what the band manager got. But either way, their jail time... And the probation time still stuck. Now, in 2009, Michael Dederin was released from prison on good behavior. Now, to date, so far, at least $176 million in civil settlements have been reached for survivors and um, families of victims, including what I've mentioned with the foam company. Um, this is from, you know, both the club owners, Michael and Jeffrey, paying as well as, you know, major companies like Home Depot and Anheuser-Busch paying to them, um, as well as the state of Rhode Island who are compensating these people. Now, June of 2003, the Station Fire Memorial Foundation was founded to purchase a property to make a memorial ground for the victims. In September of 2012, a man named Ray Villanova donated a piece of land to the foundation. And in 2006, construction commenced. And a memorial ceremony finally took place on May 21st of 2017 to commemorate the lives of these victims. Now, the fire site has also been cleared. Uh, multiple crosses were placed in memory of the deceased, uh, as well in the immediate aftermath of this tragedy and many memorials were held in hometowns of the victims too. Now as recently as the 20th anniversary of the fire the new governor of um, Rhode Island has ordered flags in Rhode Island to be lowered to half staff. Um, the state house also was illuminated in honor and memory of those victims. And if anything can be taken over here, that it was there was such an oversight and recklessness and, of course, carelessness of authority in this case. 
um, the victims and survivors, you know, they had placed their trust in people who were supposed to safeguard that, only for it to just be gutted and cut to the bone. As a result of this fire, the grandfather clause, as I mentioned, is now gone, and there are stricter fire codes. Marshals can now go in at any time in an assembly place, and if they find anything remotely out of order, they now have the authority to completely shut down the place to prevent anything like this from ever happening again. Sprinklers are now mandatory in older buildings, and if a place can assemble more than 150 people. And that only took about five months uh, for that to pass in Rhode Island after this fire. Now, while 20 years ago, for some, may seem kind of a long ways away, for those who experienced this fire, or for anybody who lost a loved one to this, the Station Nightclub fire will always be a reminder for many. Some, it may be a reminder for them to be grateful for their lives. Some, it may be a reminder to make sure to hold people accountable for their actions. Some, it may be a reminder to hold their loved ones just that much tighter. But it's always important to remember that we keep these people's memories alive because these people deserve their lives and they did not deserve what had happened to them. But that is the Station Nightclub Fire. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And if you have any other stories or any other cases that you would like me to report on or anything that you would like to add on to this story, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me at manicmannerpodcast at gmail.com. You can also reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Manic Manor Podcast. And if you feel so inclined, you can also donate. Um, I have a Patreon, uh, Manic Manor Podcast, as well, at patreon.com slash Podcast. So until the next episode, I hope you guys have a great week. Hope you guys stay safe. And I hope you guys, as always, stay happy. <laughs>